The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and this opportunity to gather once again in your name to study your most holy word. Just as people waited by the sea to hear the gospel spoken, may we too wait and learn and inwardly digest so that we may follow your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I'll make one little pivot here. I think we can do it like that. I think maybe that could get somebody in from here so you can see the yeah. Okay, well, it's all right. Oh, we can't do that. All right, so here we are. All right, we are going to begin with Isaiah, as we normally do with the uh, Old Testament. I uh, hope everyone has a copy of it in front of them. Uh, and I would ask uh, Laura, if you would mind, if you'd read from Isaiah. Okay, tell me if you can hear me. I'm going to try to increase the volume here. Can they hear me? Can y'all hear Laura? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. A reading from the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty. And the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in our lectionary cycle, and with Epiphany, this is a uh, going along with a call that people are being called to follow Jesus. When we get to the gospel, it is disciples who are being called from the shore to follow. And in the Hebrew scriptures, it is like last week with the call of Jeremiah. This is the call of Isaiah, who talks about, as we talked about this last week a little bit, this coal that is taken from the fire and placed on his lips because he finds himself to be a man of unclean lips, living among a, a people of unclean lips. It harkens a little bit to the message of James that you might remember where he talks about the tongue and how bad the tongue can be. So the same general concept in the sense of a, a bad tongue, bad lips, bad mouth. This isn't about cussing. This is just about not being able to, to speak as need to be as, as speaking. Maybe it's about kindness. Maybe it's about the gospel itself. Um, but basically he's saying <clears throat> he's having this vision in the temple and he feels completely unworthy in uh, being witness to this. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And he is, is bowing down because anyone who sees the Lord is fearful, almost as if God were Medusa. And you were going to get turned to stone the second you looked at Medusa. Um, but this humility uh, is, is answered by the angel, the seraph, who flies over and takes that coal and puts it on 
And then it said, now this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. So even with burnt lips, he could say the right words. Um, and then that's a good thing that he was now, he was now ready and appreciative and thankful uh, of being called, but also thankful of being commissioned. This is not a sedentary kind of response to God. It is a response that has to do with being sent, being active, going out into the world. Uh, and that's a very important part. Of this. <laughs> what else do you see in it? What other questions do you have from it? If you're online, just speak up, raise your hand or something like that. Yes, Bill. I think um, this uh, introdu introduction uh, highlights the importance of touch in our relationships and in our worship. Thank you. Can we finish this? Colin, you had something? <laughs> In in my printout, I've got more to that uh, section there. Yeah, we we decided to omit that, um, today, so we're not going to look at that today. Okay. Collins, you're sort of coming in and out. You're frozen. Are you are you with us? I didn't hear. All right, well, when Collins comes back, we'll give him a chance to ask. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Well, as you certainly remember, Isaiah is one of the three major prophets from the Hebrew scriptures. And he is being sent to talk to people who indeed are a people of unclean lips. And this is very important that he is, you have a sense of where he is and he did just appear out of nowhere, but there is some kind of commissioning that comes with him. Um, and we'll get to that in Paul in particular, because his credentials are being questioned somehow. We don't know exactly how by the here is that um, his, his credentials are being established in the beginning of this, that this is clearly something God has done and he is relaying this. Um, like credentials, that there weren't many witnesses to all that happened, if there was a witness at all, besides heavenly hosts. So it might make it harder to establish one's credentials unless you were able to, to tell this story with some sense of just really affirming all that that's happened. Laura? Is it significant that it said the year that King Isaiah died? Um, I don't think spiritually it's very significant. Okay. That's just the way it's, it was in a, obviously a BC or an AD at that point and not years, like even in the uh, Chinese calendar, because there are years. They marked it by moments in time. Bob? Yes. It, it sounds a little like uh, Revelation. The, the description of, 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 of the Lord on his throne and so forth. Sounds like it belongs in Revelation. Yes, you're right. Good connection. Part of the, the same holy, holy, holy what we sing on Sundays on, on many occasions uh, at the time of Eucharist is, is meant to match that song that Isaiah talks about, that Revelation talks about, that this is a song that's being sung around the throne constantly, um, eternally.
and the same way angels and seraphs doing the bidding of God. It was angels who cracked the scrolls and things like that in, in Revelation. So we, we're getting a peek into the heaven, um, which is what happens here where it's, he's in the temple in Jerusalem. You have to remember there's just one there's just one main place and his road filled the temple. So this vision is of God actually filling that temple in Jerusalem. Good. All right, Collins, we can see you again. You look like you're muted, but we love your question if you or comment if you gotta make one. Unmute yourself. Uh, I, okay, I'm now on my phone uh, clipping uh, on the done speaking. Uh, my comment was that Isaiah was having a vision. This is a, a vision experience. And uh, at that particular time, to see God uh, uh, could certainly be very frightening and in some circumstances lead to... Uh, uh, death, and yet uh, this is the first, if you will, calling of Isaiah by God, and uh, it's in the form of a question. Uh, and uh, the uh, the vision of the seraphs is reflective of uh, the carvings on the ark that uh, had those seraphs carved on it that actually came into, if you will, uh, actual being. Um, I'm gonna stop speaking now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. I mean, not thank you for stopping speaking. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's move on to the song. Um, and if we could, uh, Rich and Mary, have y'all do that? All okay. today, verses. Okay. 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 I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing you a praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your love and faithfulness. You have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord. When they have learned, when they have heard the words of your mouth, they will sing of the ways of the Lord. Great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, He cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. So I walk in the midst of trouble. You keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, o, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the work, do not abandon the works of your hands. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I think it's important um, that that's a repeat. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a prayerful plea that uh, the psalmist at this point is feeling a little bit hopeless, whether it's his personal situation, whether it's the situation of the community. Um, he has, has felt abandonment before, has felt the absence of God. It does not want that to happen. Uh, and, you know, this is one of those things when we are feeling down or a little less hope, maybe it's, has to do with war, maybe it has to do with disease, maybe it has to do with unemployment, all those other type of things. It really is the plea is make good your purpose for me. I still have a desire to live. I still have a desire to serve you. Um, do not abandon me. I am the work of your hands. Do not abandon creation, which is the work of your hands. You can think of, of all those all those things. So this is particularly um, some, some reassuring thoughts in that um, 
Some people have even said about our time now, this is a very difficult time. Things seem to be out of control, less stable, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of wonder, a lot of doubt. And it makes sense for us to pray, do not abandon the works of your hands. Do not abandon the works of your hands. And also to know in the past that this, these prayers have been effective. Uh, or, or else we wouldn't be here to read the Psalms <laughs> and, and say the things that, that need to be said in those ways. In other ways, this Psalm is good because it, it almost could be the thought pattern of Isaiah, who could give thanks to this whole part, who did bow down in the Holy Temple, who has seen God glorify his name, um, and has seen the greatness of the Lord. As that is going on, so this is this is part of the praise worthiness of God, very much like that hymn and song we just heard from Isaiah, "Glory, Holy, Holy, Holy." <clears throat> you might even think in verse eight how this like, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, in Psalm twenty-three, if I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. Mm -hmm. You think of Jesus walking to the cross in that moment. You can think of Paul and other disciples putting their life on the line in treacherous situations, be it Corinth or Jerusalem or Rome, um, where they met the fury of their enemies, the detractors, the doubters, uh, those who were trying to, to run them out of town or worse. What else do you hear and see in this passage? Yes, Lord. I'm curious why in verse one God's is plural. What what is the psalmist referring to? <laughs> so the question is um, in verse one, uh, before the gods, I will sing your praise. Why is God's plural? There are numerous plural references to gods um, in the Old Testament. Uh, from Genesis, let us make them in our image, when he's talking about creation in those ways. Um, and sometimes the, when the name of God in the Psalms is Yahweh, and Allah has focused on the, the one God, some people just think that this is reference to other heavenly beings that are God-like, but that are not capital G God, because this is clearly a monotheistic religion they have and that we have in that sense. That's but it does make it tricky. Yeah, yeah. Pagan gods just trying to put them in their place. Yeah. Right. And it, it may even be one could think that the pagans are worshiping these lesser gods that somehow or another do exist. But it also makes you think of Greek mythology and all that kind of thing where there are multiple gods and they're also fighting amongst each other and those kind of things. There's a little similarity to that in heaven, if you think of Satan and God being at odds with each other, uh, to put it lightly. And what is it to make sure that every, if, if it's before the gods I sing your praise, that those gods hear that I'm not praising them, that I am praising you. Thank yeah. you. Yes, Collins. Oh, wow. This psalm is uh, filled with praise throughout. It starts off with thanks. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge that the writer starts off his uh, section, if you will, by uh, giving thanks, but not just a, a, a present tense giving thanks, but a sort of future uh, continuing that, that giving of thanks is going to continue. And uh, that's great. Very true. <laughs> Rob, when Colin was talking, you got a lot of background noise coming coming from your uh, pod. From, from your yeah, from your pod or whatever they call it. Uh, I, I don't know why, but there's a lot of background noise coming in on that on that square. I don't either. 
Okay, it's quiet now. There it is. I can hear. I can hear somebody mumbling. <laughs> Not Collins. <laughs> well, I'm glad you bring up the word confession, Collins, because as we turn to Corinthians, which we can do now. Um, this is um, very much like Paul's confession of faith. He is, it, it sounds very much like the creed we say in terms of we believe in this and we believe in that. And these are the, the parts of our faith that come together that we are believing. It's not something, of course, as we read this, that Paul created himself. But he is saying quite clearly, I proclaim to you what I in turn had received. So this is where we talk about the apostles teaching and that Paul had received things, was it from James, was it from John, was it from Peter, was it from others that are important in this. Um, and he's talking about things, I want to focus on these words before you hear them, of first importance, of first importance. Bill, if you'd be so kind to, to read this for us, 1 Corinthians 15. Yes, I'm reading from the NIV study Bible. I'm reading from Paul's first letter to the followers in Corinth. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as a Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and according to the scripture that he appeared. Peter and to the twelve. See what's happening. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, or some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. I am the least of the apostles, and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you for the NIV translation. That's uh, NIV is is one of the three or four that I find to be really go to in terms of relatability and academic rigor um, that comes with it. And it's it's a good reminder to us too that these weren't ever written in English and that we are translating from other languages and that other words, in, in particular, uh, one of the words that was different, um, when you said as to one, if, what did you say, irregularly born or abnormally <laughs> born? Yeah. And uh, the NRSV has untimely born. And those are really different words. Um, untimely has to do with you know, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Abnormally born, uh, sort of speak to some type of birth defect. Or, and some people think that Paul did have some type of birth defect, some physical thing that made him a, a better writer or speaker. Because when people looked at him and he was, um, you know, not the strapping man that someone would want the, the speaker to be, that that makes it, uh, that makes it difficult. Yeah, whatever that thorn is, we don't we don't know what that thorn is either. 
But you can hear the, the confessional faith in this, in um, that Christ, number one, died for our sins, and here are the words in accordance with the scriptures. Number two, was buried. Number three, was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's why that word, that, that phrase is in our own Nicene Creed, because mm -hmm. we are we're talking about the fulfillment of scripture. The number four, he appeared to Cephas. Number five, um, to 500 others, brothers and sisters. Uh, number six, he appeared to James. Number seven, he appeared to all the apostles. And then he appeared to Paul as one untimely born. He's referring there to the road to Damascus when he had that vision. At least that one, if there are not others that he was referring to. So there is a, a genealogy of sorts, a chronological chronology of sorts that is important. You'll notice, and I've said this before in this class, that it has nothing to do with Jesus' birth. This has nothing to do with what he taught when he was alive. It has nothing to do with the healing. Nothing to do about being in the tribe of Benjamin or any of these other kind of things that other gospelers like Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus on. Paul is of first importance. It's not saying these other things aren't important, but of first importance to Paul is that he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And, you know, that kind of language makes it into our liturgy as well. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And the, the confessing that. Um, and that's why, for me, in the Christian faith and even the Episcopal tradition, when some people try to minimize the importance of death and resurrection, even our beloved Bishop Spong, that we have talked about in this class from time to time, who minimizes the re resurrection, this is why I'm, I'm not a Bishop Spong fan, because the, the resurrection is of, of first importance in things. Um, Paul says this in other ways. If, if this didn't happen, then our faith is for naught. There's no, there's no gospel, there's no church if there's not resurrection. And not only resurrection, that only one person can see. Again, talking about validation. Only one person was there to witness Isaiah's seeing everything in heaven. But now Peter, I mean Paul, is referring to all these people that were seen. It was Cephas, who is Peter, uh, it is James, it is the 500, it's the other apostles, and all these people, at least one or two of them, the Corinthians would have heard about, maybe even met, that there are many witnesses, not just one or two. This isn't meant to be an exhaustive list, it's not mentioning Mary Magdalene by name, but she was one of the first ones when you get to the gospel account, um, and other people <laughs> like that, but it is meant to be a conclusive list of here is the evidence. Um, you know, if you think of all the apostles, you might think of Mary Magdalene being included in that in that group too. The other thing that I think is interesting, according to the lectionary, is just as Isaiah found himself unfit at that moment. I'm a man of unclean lips, among the people of unclean lips. Here too, Paul is saying as the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle. Unfit, not because of being untimely born, but unfit because at one time he had persecuted the church. Why would you even think that this person is credentialed as having been a, a persecutor and maybe even murderer of people in the church or an accomplice to murder, that he would be fit to be called an apostle? And this is where we get into that very important word for us as Christians, Grace. As one untimely born, um, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that's confessing himself to be a sinner, confessing himself to be imperfect, but confessing that by God's grace, here I am, redeemed, able to speak the gospel, able to speak for others. And in particular, that this grace towards him has not been in vain. In other words, wasted. He poured out all this grace on you. And what'd you do? Well, I just went home and sat and read the newspaper and I mowed the lawn. And that's, that's all I did. I did. I had the grace now. I didn't need to go do anything else. 
And the point is, no, he has taken that and as part of his redemption, acted, actions, gone out into all the world. And that's what he's referring to. I worked harder than any of them. He's pretty good at boasting, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Um, but in terms of all his travels, he certainly did work hard. He certainly was up against a lot of persecution, a lot of fear, being jailed, stoned, beaten, almost killed. And then to soften it, to be humble, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. And so when we think about Christ being in us and working in us and through us, um, we always have to be careful as Christians not to take credit for something that is not us. And so this is, yes, and this is the grace of God working in us. Uh, part of that blessing that I often say after morning prayer, that is right doing the prayer book, glory to God, his power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. And that is part of the power of grace. So then whether it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Uh, this really makes me think of the song Amazing Grace. Yeah. Grace has brought me this far and grace will lead me home. That it is about grace um, that we really all depend. Isaiah is depending upon it. Paul is depending upon it. The psalmist is depending upon it. Not really using that word. And when you, when you get to it here in a minute, um, Peter and James and John also are shown grace. And that continues. So again, when we one last thing before I open it up for your questions or comments. Um, as one untimely born, it, it does make scholars think, and it makes me wonder then, was something about Paul's leadership being questioned in the Corinthian church. You might remember in the first part of this letter, some were saying, well, I was baptized by Apollos, or I was baptized by, and there's this whole thing of, some type of seniority that people are claiming and that someone else's gospel their preaching was better and all those other kind of things and so some people feel more connected that way or thinking that paul was less credential so he's somewhat standing up for his credentials just like isaiah i mean yes just like isaiah had to um, but he is also making his confession not a confession of sin only but a confession of faith. What comments or questions do y'all have? Well, yes. Um, I just want to underscore the importance of how this pertains to all of us, that we need to be aware that it is not us but the grace of God that it, um, saves us, redeems us, mm -hmm. the God who loves us. Uh, and we need to be humble and recognize that we are very unfit, mm -hmm. but grace has come through for us. This past Sunday in my class and speaking about you too, the musical group, I ended with the song that they have that's called Grace. And um, Grace makes beauty out of ugly things is one of the, the last parts of that hymn. And that's essentially what Paul is saying. I'm unfit, I'm ugly, but Grace has, has transformed that and the, the thankfulness we have of that. Any other questions? Any other Rob, Rob, could you repeat that again? Grace makes beauty out of ugly things. Woo! <laughs> well, I've got, I need that grace. Right. That's, oh. right. that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the lyrics. Yeah, the U2 song. That's right. Yes, I think it's talking more about ugly sarts 
types of personality and grades and things, but yes, right. I know. <laughs> oh, well, maybe it'll work the other way too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to the gospel then. Uh, again, we are in the, the gospel of Luke for most of year C, which, which this is. Um, and we are at this point where we talked about uh, last week, the sense of concentric circles. Jesus has landed in the pond called Earth and humanity and circle after circle after circle the, he is getting the message out, um, and the message now is in Galilee. Uh, the Lake of Gethsemane is also known as the Sea of Galilee. It just depends on the, sometimes the author, uh, sometimes the time, um, but to distinguish between bodies of water, it's sort of like, you know, this lake is certainly smaller than Lake Superior or Lake Huron or one of the, the great lakes that we have. Um, it is not a sea in the sense that it is um, not salty like the Dead Sea, which is completely salty, um, or the Mediterranean Sea. So I think they are distinguishing between, between those. So this is in the northern part, um, in, the, in the Galilean part, not too far from Nazareth, not too far from Capernaum. Um, where so much of his ministry happened. Uh, but it's also clear here that he is calling these fishermen and in the end asking them to, um, to be those who net people or who catch people in, in what, they're, what they're doing. So I'll read here from Luke 5. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake or of Gesenaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats there at the shore of the lake, and the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. We pause there and just to say, scholars say that the sitting posture is the posture of a teacher. He is not sitting for some sense of balance or whatever in the boat. But teachers in, in this time, rabbis would, would sit down to teach. So there is something in that body language. When he had finished speaking, we don't know how long he spoke or what he said, unfortunately, at this point. But when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, um, as the sort of one who stands over. So there's already a sense of seniority that is here. We have worked all night long, which makes me think this is in the early morning hours. If you're a, a duck hunter or a fisherman or something like that, sometimes when you go out is from three to six and then you're done. You come in and there's light. Um, and I would think the daylight is one of the things that made the crowds come back out to what was happening. And they saw the, the fishermen there cleaning their nets, mending their nets from a night of um, no luck. We've worked all night long, but have caught nothing. So there's first a little bit of a pushback. And then a turnaround. Yet, yeah, if you say so. I will let down the nets. When they, he had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, from a I'm a sinful man. So here in terms of the lectionary is the third direct account of somebody feeling unfit, getting down on his knees like Isaiah did in the temple, bowing down. Or Paul saying the same type of thing, I am unfit, go away from me, Lord. 
I don't want to die, but to see you and die. For he and all who were with him were amazed, you might say in awe, at the catch of fish that they had taken. So this wasn't an ordinary kind of catch, once in a lifetime catch, you might even say. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So those who are business partners are about to become partners in the gospel. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. So just like Isaiah was sort of asked, who will go? Um, these don't necessarily ask, but they are told, you will go. You will go and catch people. And when they had brought their boats ashore, then they left everything and followed him. So there's an immediacy in this response to the call of sending out, leaving everything. Maybe even all the fish they just caught, the nets that they were mending, the boats that they had had, maybe that had been their father's 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 boat. We don't know what it is. But they left everything to follow him. That's one of the, the marks of these these kind of calls that people who are responding to the gospel, whether it's Paul doing it, preaching it, or Peter and others preaching it, there's immediacy of leaving everything to follow. 